Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning, good evening, if you're watching this in different time zones. Uh, my name is Paul Adamson. I'm the chairman of Forum Europe. It is my very great pleasure to welcome you to this high-level discussion on GDPR two years on, what has been achieved and what challenges remain, which is being organized ahead of the slightly delayed second annual review of the GDPR by the European Commission. My warmest thanks to the speakers who have taken time in their busy schedules to be with us today, to our sponsor Workday, and the more than 500 of you who have registered for this event. We will aim to take stock of the benefits the regulation has unleashed, discuss the gaps that remain to be addressed, and the broad impact of the regulation in these last two years. We will discuss how the challenges and concerns around compliance and the alignment of enforcement across the member states can be best addressed, and the capacity also and resilience of the GDPR in facing continuous development of new data-driven innovations. I suspect also that the current health crisis will capture our attention. Uh, I have a number of uh, technical uh, housekeeping points to run by you as well, so please keep paying attention. Uh, point one, the hashtag is GDPR two years on. GDPR uppercase two number two. Why uppercase years on? GDPR years on. Uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, you will notice the chat function. You can use this to post questions and comments, and I will do my best to include as many as possible. You are currently watching this opening panel in the stage area of the platform. Once I close this panel, you are invited to navigate to the discussion tab on the left-hand side of your screen, and then to the Have Your Say session, where Aline Chivot will moderate a panel afterwards, where you can get involved by clicking on the Share Audio and Video button, uh, we will then, at the appropriate time, add you to the live feed where you can make your comments on screen in front of everybody else. All the sessions are recorded, and we will make the replays available as soon as possible on the event website, uh, details of which will be sent to you in due course. Another possibility for you while you're on the platform, on the right-hand side, you will notice the, the People tab. If you select a fellow participant, you can chat with them or invite them to a one-on-one -on -one private conversation. So you're welcome to try out that particular functionality. Uh, if you have any colleagues who are not registered, they can watch the live stream on Forum Europe's YouTube page and Forum Europe's Twitter page. Finally, if you have any technical issues or require any support, do feel free to reach out to my colleagues who are monitoring the chat area and will respond very quickly to you. So without further ado, let me introduce our extremely distinguished panel this afternoon. Sala Sastamoinen, who is the Acting Deputy Director General of DG, Just, DG Justice at the European Commission here in Brussels. Uh, Andrea Jelinek, who is the Chairwoman of the European Data Protection Board, called, coming to us from Vienna. Barbara Cosgrove, who is Vice President and Chief Privacy Officer at Workday, who is actually, would you believe it, talking to us today from San Francisco, where it is some stupid o'clock time in the morning. Um, and finally, Isabella de Michelis, CEO and founder of Ernie App, speaking to us from, from London. Uh, all our speakers have been asked to say a few words at the, at the outset, five, six minutes or so. We'll see how it goes. And then I will engage in a, a, a conversation with all panelists and ask them to react to what they've heard from their fellow panelists. And, and then in very short order, I'll be looking out for these questions coming in from, from you, the audience, and you can take part in the discussion uh, as soon as we could make the time available to you. So I think that's well enough from me, and it gives me very great pleasure to invite Salah to take the floor. Over to you, Salah. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, and good afternoon to everybody. It's great to join you all uh, this virtual way today afternoon on a very topical subject about the data protection, about the GDPR. Topical in the sense that uh, we have now used uh, some time to evaluate the GDPR uh, in the Commission. Unfortunately, we did not get it uh, fully completed as a Commission report by this event. So I will speak to you still uh, in, in the general level. But uh, the good thing is coming uh, in, in one week or next week. It's scheduled to be adopted by the College and then you will have the full Commission report on the implementation of the GDPR uh, for the first two years. 
We will we have built up our report on quite broad way, taking till into account also what the regulation says to cover the international transfer of personal data and also the cooperation and consistency between data protection authorities as specific act, as specific aspects uh, in the future report. The data protection and the GDPR is also topical for us all from that perspective that the COVID crisis that we have been living on has showed the importance of address the concerns of citizens as regards trustworthy digital solutions. That's an essential condition to finding uh, societal acceptance for possible uh, tracing apps, uh, all those solutions that are driven by data. For all those, the GDPR is then our starting point. Uh, the regulation has been there for two years, so our last two years have been very much focused on the strong support for the implementation, for its implementation. We have engaged with the bilateral dialogues with the member states on the compliance of the national legislations, we are, have worked very closely with the uh, data protection authorities, also in the context of the uh, European Data Protection Board. We support those authorities financially by grants, uh, as, for example, the resources for projects is one of the aspects. And we want to uh, maintain a close contact uh, with a wide range of stakeholders, and that's why I'm also very happy that I heard that you are so many uh, participating for today's event. When we are evaluating the implementation, we have been in contact indeed uh, with, uh, with a broad uh, uh, range of uh, party, uh, partners from the uh, Council to the European Parliament uh, to the data authorities that I mentioned. Uh, uh, this was mainly through our uh, GDPR multi-stakeholder group. And then I come already maybe the one of the first main messages. Uh, the evaluation uh, does not aim to reopen the GDPR. That is then something that, uh, that uh, uh, we, we can conclude. It, it's an evaluation opportunity to assess the progress made and to see what are the areas that will need further addressing. And all the actors who have been involved, uh, uh, we find that working together, uh, focusing together, our efforts uh, will bring us even a stronger, better uh, enforcement and implementation of the uh, general data protection regulation. This is even more important uh, because the GDPR is the, uh, the, the main crucial component for a human-centric approach to technology and digital transition. Digital transition is uh, 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 one of the clear priorities uh, for the Commission currently. It is highlighted by the uh, actions uh, or uh, like the white paper on the artificial intelligence and the European data, uh, strategy for data that the Commission published, adopted in quite in the beginning in its mandate. Uh, for the white paper, we have had the public consultation going on. All innovation, like what we are after with this kind of white papers and strategies in the data-driven areas, innovation needs a strong data protection rules. And the GDPR does this. It has the flexibility, uh, it has the risk-based approach and principles like the data protection by design, data protection by default, and these enable it to be the driver also for the innovation. Importantly, from the point of view of the single market, uh, the GDPR creates a level playing field for all companies uh, operating in our union market, regardless where they are established. The second part, another part from the implementation that we see is that the people, uh, citizens, uh, they are increasingly aware of their rights and that they exercise them vis-à-vis uh, -vis the organizations who are processing their personal data. Uh, we see that the individuals have been, uh, are or start to be uh, uh, very uh, used to for their rights, they are using the rights in practice, and there are also complaints uh, to the data protection authorities. And this is not a bad thing, that helps the 
GDPR uh, data protection environment uh, to develop. So we find that this is positive. It shows that something it functions in the practice and the structures created by the GDPR are there to handle the uh, issues or situations that might be problematic. We also see that these data protection authorities are taking the corrective measures and they use their stronger powers under the GDPR, ranging from warnings, uh, giving reprimands to the administrative, uh, even to administrative fine. Uh, one point I even a little bit referred also earlier, all this work by the data protection authorities means that they will need also that they do need also the sufficient resources and the situation here is a bit uneven between the member states so therefore we urge the member states to remedy the situation and ensure sufficient uh, resources uh, to the independent uh, uh, these independent authorities uh, Next point to make is that uh, by the uh, by the GDPR we established a quite innovative governance system to ensure the coherent, effective application uh, of the regulation through the so-called one-stop shop. Uh, there, the data protection authorities are increasingly working together and cooperating, and uh, there we think that this should continue. They should further continue to develop their efforts to have a truly common data protection culture uh, all over uh, the Europe. And there, the new governance system can still develop more, deliver more uh, when we are using it uh, better. Also important work of the data protection authorities has been the guidance to the stakeholders that has been much uh, demanded, that has been much uh, appreciated what we found. And in particular SMEs uh, uh, have been in need for the targeted tools and they have received that kind of guidance. So that is, the, that is a good side. Uh, naturally, then uh, it's this international data flows. So need to ensure the trust or the demand for the protection of the personal data is not limited to the EU. And there, the GDPR in these two years of existence has uh, developed as a, a key reference point for the international level. So it has set a universal trend where I can, as the EU, uh, be proud of. Uh, we see that it is followed from South Korea to Brazil, from Chile to Japan. Uh, more and more countries are adopting modern privacy uh, laws with similar features than data protection regime. So that way, uh, uh, we are, as an EU, acting as a global uh, trend, uh, standard setter in the digital economy sphere. Uh, our possibilities for safe international data flows are linked with the uh, uh, trade. The EU is uh, trying to strengthen the protection of, uh, of uh, protecting the Europeans when data is transferred abroad and at the same time uh, ensuring uh, uh, good and sound uh, trade relations. And there the example is, for example, the 2019 EU-Japan mutual adequacy arrangements that created the world's largest uh, area of free flow of data at the same time when we created an, uh, a large uh, trade area. So this, these two aspects should go together. Uh, providing that this, uh, and that is when we talk about the, the relations to the third countries, uh, we are also then talking actually our uh, 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 close neighbor UK, and providing thus that the necessary conditions are met, the adequacy plays an important role in the context of Brexit. It is there also a key enabler for trade, including digital trade. So this year, our attention is to work uh, very much on the uh, adequacy, adequacy uh, decisions, uh, adequacy assessment, adequacy decisions as regards uh, the UK. On the international side, it's not limited our work to the adequacy decisions. We are also working on the comprehensive modernization of the contractual clauses. We are working on the uh, international transfer toolbox for the GDPR. Uh, so there is uh, that that these aspects uh, continue uh, continue currently. 
uh, finally, relating to these uh, external aspects, maybe it's uh, good to say clearly that we are making distinction between the data protection and the data protectionism. That's why we want to tackle the purely protectionist measures, such as forced data localization requirements, and uh, systematically tabling text proposals to our trade negotiations in those kind of cases. To conclude, our EU data protection system is about ensuring a high level of protection while being open to the data flows. This is uh, what the Commission has pushed through the negotiation, what it has pushed uh, through the implementation, implementation period, and on what we will continue to work on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Sally. You covered a huge amount of ground in just over 10 minutes, so you really have set the scene for us. Uh, the more you kept speaking, the more questions I had in my mind, but I promise everybody I will hold back until I've heard from all the panelists. And, and now, without further ado, over to you, Andrea. You have the floor. Andrea. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are around <laughs> our globe. Uh, first, thanks uh, for inviting me to this panel discussion today and for taking part in what promises to be an interesting discussion between the people who conceive the GDPR, the people who oversee its implementation and the people that implement it on a daily basis. I just want to introduce you the EDPP, the European Data Protection Board, because I'm not quite sure if I, everybody knows what we are doing. The EDPP started its activities on May 25th, 2018, with the entry into application of the GDPR. The EDPP is an independent European body with legal personality that contributes to the consistent application of data protection rules throughout the European Union and the EEA and promotes cooperation within supervisory authorities. The EDPP replaced the Article 29 Working Party, which previously grouped the EU supervisory authorities, the ETPS and the European Commission. So, just three weeks ago, the GDPR turned two years old. You know, at the, when you have the first birthday of a, of a child, uh, it starts to go and to run, and with the second birthday, most of the children already start to speak. And so, we already tried to speak on the 25th of March, 2018, and we try to move forward quickly. The European Data Protection Board did not wait until the 25th May, 2020, to take stock of how the GDPR is being implemented across the European economic area. We began our re reflection at the start of the year when we adopted our report on the application of the GDPR which we were invited to contribute by the Commission, like uh, General Director already said, and which outlined our experience of putting the GDPR into practice. This report is the European Data Protection Board's contribution to the biannual evaluation of the GDPR. The European Commission will publish this evaluation, as General Director already said, on the 24th of June, and it will cover international data transfers as well as the state of the application of the rules. While the world has been transformed in many ways since we adopted our report in February, our view on the implementation of the GDPR has not changed and, will, and we still stand firmly by our analysis from four months ago. The ETPP, is of the opinion that a lot has been achieved since the 25th of May 2018 and in the months prior to that. Since the entry into application of the GDPR, the EDPP has a, as a new decision-making body has adopted various guidelines to clarify fundamental provisions of the GDPR as well as opinions to ensure a consistent application of the law throughout the European economic area. We have advised the legislator on a number of topics and we have cooperated closely through the one-stop shop mechanism to deal with cross-border cases. One observation we have found as a body of regulators 
and this won't come as a surprise, is that the resolution of cross-border cases is time and resource intensive. We have therefore made it very clear in our report that it is of the utmost importance that the national governments fund the regulators appropriately. The effective application of the powers and tasks attributed by the GDPR to supervisory authorities is largely dependent on the resources available to them. Another challenge that we have been faced with are the differences in national administrative procedural laws and practices. We are committed to finding solutions to overcome these challenges where these issues lie within our competence. While the challenges we face when implementing the cooperation and consistency mechanism cannot be neglected and will require some more hard work, we are not in favor of a GDPR 2.0 in our view, it is too soon to consider revising the GDPR, as also the Director General mentioned before. And especially because not all of the instruments of the GDPR have been used during these two last years. Our experience with implementing the GDPR is encouraging. The supervisory authorities give positive reports on the GDPR the new cooperation duties imply that many exchanges between the supervisory authorities take place on a daily basis as we work together on several hundred cross-border cases at the time. The supervisory authorities signal that they appreciate the value of these exchanges with their counterparts and believe that this cooperation is crucial for the success of the GDPR. So far, all cases that were finalized until now have been resolved in the cooperation phase without the European Data Protection Board having to intervene. In addition, our stakeholders with whom we have dialogues via events, workshops and surveys report that they find our guidance useful, pragmatic and operational. We notice that our stakeholders are keen to engage with us. They are open to sharing examples from their daily practice to help us make sure we address and clarify the issues they have to deal with when implementing the GDPR. We also note greater public awareness around data protection. The development of tracing apps to monitor and contain the spread of COVID-19 today sparks a wide public debate, something which perhaps would not have been the case a few years ago. In conclusion, we are convinced that the cooperation between data protection authorities will result in a common data protection culture and in consistent practices across Europe, but we do not expect it to happen overnight. And now I'm looking forward to listen to the others and uh, looking forward to our discussion. Thanks to all of you. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrea. That's very helpful as well. And a good lead into our, our next speaker for the private sector, uh, Barbara Crosgrove. Over to you, Bob, all the way in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Hello, thank you for having me as part of the panel. Um, first, I'll do a brief introduction of Workday. Workday is a leading provider of enterprise cloud applications for finance and human resources. Founded in 2005, Workday delivers financial management, human capital management, and analytics applications designed for the world's largest companies, education institutions, and government agencies. Organizations ranging from medium-sized businesses to Fortune 50 enterprises have selected Workday. Headquartered in California, as you see me drinking my coffee early here, <laughs> Workday has more than 12,000 employees worldwide, including 2,000 in our 21 offices across, work, across Europe. We serve more than 550 Europe-based customers. At Workday, privacy has been built into our program from day one. We believe that privacy is a fundamental right, and we're deeply committed to protecting our workforce as well as our customers' privacy. We aim to be a very productive partner with European institutions protecting strong data protection. This is evidenced by our privacy program. 
We are among the first companies to certify to the Privacy Shield, and we formally participated in the industry portion of both the second and third annual Privacy Shield reviews. We build products that include features that not only ensure that Workday is GDPR compliant as a data processor of our customers' data, but also that we have features that enable their compliance as data controllers of their data. We, we continue to demonstrate our commitment to realizing the goals of GDPR through our compliance efforts, but we do believe that it's important to address cross-border data flows. The free flow of data is critical for enterprise providers like Workday. Workday would be unable to provide a solution for our global customers or its customers if we weren't able to have efficient cross-border data flows. In addition to the Privacy Shield certification, Workday uses standard contractual clauses as well as we have been certified to binding corporate rules as a data processor. We believe it's critical to continue to have the free flow of data in order to support customers. However, we do believe there can be continue to be some additional guidance and additional data transfer mechanisms in order to make this easier for a cloud provider and customers to adopt the use of cloud providers. We, we would encourage the continuation of looking into the treatment of subprocessors um, under the standard contractual clauses in terms of how a enterprise cloud company is able to provide a consistent experience for our customers through the use of subprocessors. We also think it's critical to look at having a additional data transfer mechanism and continue the efforts in terms of looking for a processor to subprocessor standard contractual clause mechanism. We are very appreciative of the guidance that the European Data Protection Board has issued. This, this guidance has provided value for us and we believe our customers in terms of helping us to navigate the GDPR and to interpret concepts in a harmonized manner. Um, having a different guidance come country by country can at times conflict with the intent behind the GDPR and we really embrace the harmonized approach. And so we're appreciative of the guidance and look forward to seeing continued guidance. Um, with that, I'll, I'll wrap up my comments, but really look forward to this discussion today. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. In the discussion, we'll come back to how companies like you have been handling GDPR over the last two years and any suggestions you may have uh, going forward. That'll come in the discussion. So you are hereby warned. Uh, last but not least, as they always say on these occasions, Isa, Isabella de Michaelis, over to you. Thank you. Thank you and hello to everyone. Um, I'm very glad as a representative of the very small world of the startup to be part of this conversation. And um, I'm also very glad to have this opportunity to widen a little bit beyond what our uh, geography is. I hope that there are um, dialers from outside Europe. We are a European company. We are established, uh, Ernie App, it's the name of the company and the name of the product. It's established in Dublin. And uh, we have uh, started uh, looking at what GDPR would mean for consumers um, a little bit earlier than when actually um, uh, it entered into force. We started back in 2017 and we told ourselves that uh, probably uh, the entire world would look at this amazing thing that Europe had done to adopt such a great um, policy and regulation but lots of people would also find themselves a little bit lost in space in actually how to benefit from it. And if uh, there was a community that we thought we should be really caring of, these were the consumers. So we decided to take the angle of looking at what the consumers could understand of GDPR and actually how they could benefit it, even if they wouldn't be knowing all the details and complexities that GDPR carries, that is a fairly big structure, especially for companies, if, I, if they have to comply and they have to comply. But how it is felt by consumers was really the mission we took on. So what we did was essentially to focus on another aspect of the GDPR, which we consider extremely valuable and important. That is when companies decide to um, base the data collection and processing on the basis of 
the consent as legal basis. You know that there are a variety of legal basis for uh, companies to use GDPR and collecting data. But we as a little company, we wanted to focus on a subset of use cases that were those where companies um, uses consent for uh, being allowed, for allowing themselves to collect and process the data. So with this recipe, um, user empowerment, um, user site, user centric, human centric and consent centric, we designed a mobile app. And this mobile app is actually something very simple. It's very frictionless and it allows uh, for someone to um, log in by, gener by registering an account. And it uses this app as a remote control to audit and change and track all the state of their consent across all the accounts it wants to link into our platform. So basically the experience you have as a user uh, when you use our application, it's that it simplifies your point of access to all the consent states, your opt-in, your opt-out in a very, very easy way. And we've seen, uh, we've we've launched on the stores uh, last year. We've got a lot of users all, like, all around Europe. We are supporting two languages at the moment, English and Italian. But we are going forward to actually support um, in the coming months, German and French and Spanish and Portuguese. And little by little, we'll implement it in all the European spoken languages. And we see that we have a very frictionless experience. The people we have using our app goes from 16 years old to 85 years old. Um, they are men and women all across Europe. And they discover that enjoying privacy, it's so simple. It can be as simple as a click. You have your remote control, you have all your views together, you decide if you want to be opted in on Google or on Facebook or not. And if you want to delete your data, GDPR allows users to delete their personal data. It's great. The only thing is that companies make it a little bit complicated for people to find it how to do it. So we made it simple. And as a mobile app, uh, you can also control basically across all your devices, uh, whether it's a set box or a TV or a smartphone, every uh, point of um, access for you to the internet is managed through, your, through the accounts. So you essentially control through your accounts how much exposure you want to have on third parties. Then we provide a, a very um, novel way to uh, drag the attention of people onto why they should care about their privacy. Sometimes we read on newspapers, common papers, sometimes also the papers of the commission, and they talk about their fear of users being a little bit apathic and not being responsive to this great opportunity of implementing their fundamental rights. Um, on, on, a, on a very, very um, um, honest uh, um, statement, I would say that users are not apathic, but they're distracted. They're so busy with their life. They're so busy with consuming online uh, content and service and information. They're bombarded, bombarded, bombarded with new things that get them very happy. They're a little bit distracted. So to get them less distracted, we introduced two things in the app. We introduced a meter that computes the user's generosity uh, based on the state of their opt-in and opt-out. So it basically alerts a user on whether he's been a little bit fairly generous or less generous because maybe he forgot about checking on his privacy settings on that application. And that meters computes in real time actually your exposure onto the third party. So, so you really get it as a flag. It flags you if you're giving away too much and maybe you didn't want, or it's fine. You wanted to give that much and you're just fine with that. But it gives you a daily update of that and it's an hourly or a minute update of that. And last but not least, we inserted in the app a game. And the game is, I think, the most fun part of it because we wanted to uh, use gamification to attract people's attention on um, the beauty of enjoying a legal system where GDPR is so strong and also having uh, a norm in Europe that applies for every business in the world. So you don't need to be in Europe actually as a company to be uh, abiding to the GDPR. And that's it's a fairly big challenge because people, again, are distracted. They are uh, solicited by 
thousands of um, pop-ups here and there. They visit websites all around the world. They can rarely really know and check whether the provider is based in the European Union or not. With GDPR, it's beautiful. So the basic assumption is that all our users and every other one who will be checking into the application and registering with the application, they discover through a game um, a lot of the technicalities of how the GDPR applies in real life to mid-sized and big companies, to companies in Europe and outside Europe. But they also discover how technology works, uh, what it is the cookie tracking, uh, how you're tracked by Wi-Fi hotspot, or uh, what it is your uh, digital projection into when you are gaming or when you are um, maybe exercising in a place and you're wearing certain devices that track you. It also illustrates very, very simply how data monetization happens online because we think, and really I'll, I'll probably close there, I don't want to jeopardize too much the, the time today. We really would love to have lots of questions about the model we pushed out. We think people get attentive when they realize the intricacies of how the internet world and, and how the monetization work and how the privacy work. They need to know who the players are and they need to know they are part of the equation. Um, Sal was mentioning how it's important for innovation to have a strong data protection foundation and we cannot agree more than that. At the same time, the users, they need to understand that to make innovation flourishing, there is a need for data. So you want to have a very strong, transparent and trusted environment for companies and people to uh, collaborate on an equal footing. But because there are so many companies not behaving right and really, really mismanaging the, the people's data, it's also important to have unilateral uh, solutions for users to enforce their rights. So I'm a particular fund of the provision in GDPR that allows the user not just to obtain an opt out, but also to delete their data and also to transfer the data that apply to them within a certain service provider, um, cloud uh, storage databases, because the world of business needs the data, but those data need to be consented to be monetized because the consent resides in user decision and the technicality of how to track and tag that exist. The, I, we think the most beautiful thing GDPR did was to actually create this ability for the user to become stronger and to become effective and to become very effective in how they're going to be confirming their trust on the companies that deserve it and sanction the companies that don't deserve their data because they don't deserve their trust. So I think I'll stop here and I'll be very happy to hand it to over you, Paul. Thank you, thank you very much, Isa. Well, that concludes the opening interventions by our panel. Uh, I see we're already getting questions in from the audience, which is very good news. I did say at the beginning also, I'd be inviting the panel panelists to react to their fellow panelists. But before that, I have some questions, brief questions to, to put to to some, if not most of you, uh, who've already spoken. Um, first of all, to you, to you, Sal, if I may, um, I get the very clear message you said that this evaluation is not a, an opportunity to, to reopen GDPR, a clear message to all the lobbies out there, don't use this as a way to fighting old battles, I suppose, in, in effect. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm sure this is not a, the document due to be published uh, next week is not a bland document. You've invited and received, no doubt, many unsolicited inputs from uh, different stakeholders. So uh, obviously you can't say too much about the content, but um, in broad terms, have you been pleasantly surprised by, by the reaction of GDPR two years on, or some things taken you by surprise, which you think genuinely and sincerely merit further attention from the European Commission's point of view? Uh no, thank you. Thank you for that question. And thank you to uh, also first to all the co-speakers. Uh, that was uh, extremely interesting and, uh, and useful to hear. Uh, but this is something that we have been indeed doing. We have been trying to work very closely with the stakeholders uh, uh, from the public authorities to the private side for the last two years. And that means that there is not so much surprises. We have seen uh, throughout the two years implementation period that uh, 
uh, those uh, those uh, aspects that we will then uh, report on uh, uh, the aspects for example it was uh, it was uh, it was uh, as it was mentioned for andreas that there has been the guidance for the data protection uh, uh, board and that as said by the then the others that that has been very useful it has been very much welcomed uh, by the uh, um, by the users, uh, so by the by the companies, uh, that means that that type of guidance that uh, should uh, continue. Uh, the uh, second point, uh, what I also mentioned already, that people are already aware they use their rights uh, and they are really appreciating the privacy. This is a feedback that we are we are getting. So that way, uh, and that was. Uh, we couldn't we couldn't ask them then more uh, uh, better uh, better speakers like what uh, there was both uh, Isabella and Barbara were saying so it's very much similar uh, uh, feedback what we are what we are getting uh, it is then for the international data flows their importance has been stressed what what we have received and that is something that we will indeed continue uh, working on that toolbox that can be used and working on further uh, for the adequacy decisions so there's a long list of the uh, of the countries we are checking the existing adequacy uh, decisions and we are looking at the further uh, uh, further than uh, countries and are in contact with them so those stakeholders are indeed what they are asking they are asking this consistent harmonized enforcement and that I can sell that that's naturally something that we will then support also in the report. Oh, okay. Uh, a question to you, Andrea, please, if I may. Um, I was intrigued by uh, by Sala's introductory comments when she, under the rubric of, of governance and the one-stop shop, she made the point about the need to do more to create a common data protection culture. And you said in your own intervention that it, there's an issue there because cross-border cases certainly are time consuming and quite costly and you need more more resources. Um, uh, I accept that. Um, apparently, you muted yourself, Andrea. You have to put yourself back on unmute, OK? Um, I, I, I thought the whole point of having a regulation, which was replacing a directive from 1995, was to have, to use the jargon, direct effect. So I'm, I'm curious to know why there is these huge disparities, well, these certain disparities across member states, this, and how far, how big an issue is it about creating this common uh, data protection culture that Sala refer to uh, thanks for passing me the floor regarding these issues uh, first of all i want to thank uh, the uh, director general uh, because in her speech she mentioned that it will be necessary and it's still necessary uh, that the data protection authorities that the national independent supervisory authorities are getting sufficient resources from their governments this is one of the issues. The other, uh, one of the other issues is uh, that there are different um, administ administrative procedural laws, uh, which makes it really difficult to overcome these differences. But we try and do our best. Uh, we already uh, let made a, a study on this issue, and we are trying to overcome this uh, as far as we are able to and it is really interesting that it helps quite a lot that we already were used to work together very closely as working party 29 uh, and just to give you an an idea about the amounts of cross-border cases at the moment uh, the moment is uh, the third of june uh, we have we are working on more than 1000 uh, cross-border cases and uh, some of these cross-border cases uh, are involving all uh, of our supervisory authorities, others only two or three or four supervisory authorities. So you see the exchange of information and the exchange of knowledge uh, is very important in these cross-border cases and it really helps to know each other and to speak to each other sometimes on a daily basis on specific cases to support each other, to help each other also to overcome also cultural differences because you know uh, there is uh, the in the past it was quite different if you were acting in finland or in austria or in spain or in italy uh, as it was a directive we had a puzzle of different uh, legal um, questions to solve now we are going to solve these legal questions together 
and it's quite a challenge. But uh, you know, solving cross-border cases is not a quick fix uh, thing. We have to have time and you have to have resources uh, to communicate and also to understand each other uh, what is meant, uh, how you are dealing with these cases. You know, we have quite a lot of expert subgroups who are dealing on cooperation and on enforcement and also on international transfer and compliance and so on. And all of our uh, DPAs are contributing to these expert subgroups uh, with all of our knowledge. And so I think we will overcome some challenges and I'm quite in a good mood that we will get it. This, thank you, but um, I just wonder whether this, is, this may sound like a stupid question, but uh, this question of a, of a common culture, it doesn't just apply, does it, to cross-border case. It also applies to maybe the a potential uneven application within each member state of the GDPR. If different member states and DPAs have different ways of interpreting the GDPR, even though it's a regulation, that causes potential uh, concerns or not? Am I missing the point there? Uh, first of all, thanks for the question. Uh, second, a moderator is never missing the point, never. <laughs> uh, and third, I think um, as we know each other, um, it, it facilitates our work, but we also have to look in our own backyards everywhere, and this doesn't have anything to do with the GDPR. Uh, it's it's a question of how we are working together throughout the whole European Union and try to come even more together. And I think um, as this crisis we are facing now shows, um, in, in real crisis, we really get closer together and help each other even more and support each other even more than it was thought before. And I think the GDPR is, and what we have done during the last month uh, as European Data Protection Board and the supervisory authorities uh, in their own competences shows that the cooperation between each other, between the all of us uh, is functioning quite well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. We'll come to the health crisis, I promise you, before the end of the session. Uh, a question to you, uh, Barbara. You. In your opening remarks, you were quite diplomatic about, about GDPR, and I understand why, why you would be. I, I would be is also in your position. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm, I, uh, without trying to put words in your mouth, are you hoping and expecting that in the review that uh, Salo has been talking about, there will be some recognition of some of the deficiencies or inadequacies of GDPR, and which ones, and if so, uh, would you pick out one or two that you would like to have particularly addressed in that review? <laughs> um, I, I will say I was, I was more than um, I wasn't trying to be diplomatic. We we really do believe that and support the GDPR um, as a, a cloud company that processes data from around the world. Um, having the harmonized approach to data protection, we really felt was beneficial, um, as opposed to having to look to the country by country approach. And um, at Workday, for the type of data that we process, we really need our customers to understand that we've built strong privacy protections into our program. Um, we believe that privacy um, can go hand in hand with innovation. And so, so we truly are supporters of it. Um, but looking to where, where we would like to see some clarifications or um, updates in it, I think um, going back again to being that cl a cloud business and needing to demonstrate compliance for our customers, uh, you know, a couple of years later now, we've, we've been creative in how we demonstrate. We, in addition to our binding corporate rules certification, um, we've done mappings to the third party audit certifications that we have um, in order to demonstrate to our customers how we process data um, and how our control framework is comprehensive and built to support their requirements. Um, but we are really looking forward to the approval of a code of conduct or certification scheme um, as envisioned in GDPR. We, we do think that's critical in order to make those conversations easier and to be able to demonstrate that we are doing the right thing. Um, so we, we are hopeful that, uh, that one of those will get passed. Um, we're strong supporters of having that type of compliance mechanism. So it's easier for a customer that's using a cloud service to be able to understand that a company is doing the right thing and to have that um, 
an independent way, um, just the way we evidence our other security and privacy controls. We, we really invest a lot in those programs to prove to our customers um, that it's not just trust. And so I would see that being a very positive thing going forward, just to see one of those mechanisms get passed. Okay, thank you, Barbara. And a question to you is, uh, um, that was obviously Barbara on the sort of B2B side of the debate. And obviously, your, your startup is much more consumer focused with real people uh, as your customer client base, whether they're 16 or 85 years old, as you said. Um, Salah made a point that you hear often in EU policy circles, no doubt sincerely made, that um, uh, consumers are very grateful for this protection uh, that GDPR offers. And uh, they're increasingly, as many speakers have said, aware of what it's all about, even without going into detail, they are aware that there are, there, there are laws out there designed to, 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 to protect citizens' uh, data, all the rest of it. Having said that, in your experience so far with your new startup, uh, do you have any sense that some consumers are, are quite happy to trade, that they, they accept as a trade-off between getting free services online and giving and data, and, and that in a sense they, that the protection might be there, but if that means that certain services can't be made available essentially free of charge, then uh, data privacy and data protection is less of a priority for them. Um, thank you, Paul. Uh, this is a very tricky question. I like to put it on me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let, let's put it this way. Um, I, I think that the users, I wouldn't talk about consumers, I'll talk about users and users have been spoiled for many, many years to enjoy new digital services and this being frictionless. Because the way you get their attention and their engagement is that the service needs to be easy to use. What it is a little bit more tricky is to get them using a privacy service that comes for free to them and it's still not in exchange of their data as an invisible transaction. Because I think that the users have now come a little bit more acquainted with the fact that it's not because the service is free, it is really free. There is an exchange, but there's no transparency in that exchange. Actually, there's no like a monetary reference or something. They can get comfortable with understanding what it means, but they are not completely oblivious on the fact that there is a transaction. Now, the reality is that the, the industry uh, we all love, the in innovation industry, and in particular, the IT industry, is inventing constantly new things, new devices, new platforms, new solutions that uh, carries and triggers and process a lot of data. And not all the time these data are personal, and not all the time the data are needed for supporting a free ad funded service, which is an additional layer of complexity for the user to get understanding because on condition that they were told the service is free because you give away your data. But the point is that you also give away your data if you pay the service you're paying. So there's no really more boundaries between a free service and, uh, and a subscription based service. The data are still collected and the data are still processed. And sometimes they're processed beyond the purpose for which they are collected. So to look at the preoccupation of the people in the street and how they perceive the privacy story versus the privacy economics. And so the ability for them to monetize potentially with their own gain, uh, an economic gain, the sharing of the data. I think that the debate is actually getting a little bit complicated since in Europe we had the distinction between GDPR data ruled in a certain way, personal and e-privacy data used for marketing and electronic communication do, ruled in another way. So to the extent, for example, that Andrea and Sala said that after the assessment on the GDPR anniversary, there is consensus that there's no need to reopen it, but certainly there are areas of improvement. As a representative of the consumers and a representative of the users, serving them a service that is a privacy engine on third parties, I think that there would be a lot of benefit in clarifying the linkages for the consumer between the data that are dealt under e-privacy and the data that are dealt under GDPR, because for the users, that subtle difference that it's very clear to the enterprises, that it's very clear to the business, it doesn't really exist. And to really finish my, my reasoning and to try to answer your tricky question is, the world is divided more or less in 50% people who are really caring about being private and protected. 
and the other half who is just about the incentives to understand whether they're going to be trusting enough the counterpart to share the data and give it for enrichment purpose, for contextual uh, analysis purpose, for uh, AI purpose. So it's a little bit of a wrong thing that when we say, are people are people really thinking that getting paid for their data is a good thing and is it a feasible thing? Is a wrong is a wrong question actually because you don't need to be paid to make a decision that it's worth sharing the, those data in exchange of something else. And maybe right. I can jump on the COVID thing. I mean, you've heard about all the fuzz and the right. and the emotions of people about sharing their data on tracking right. and tracing and tracing. The Commission and the European Data Protection Authorities in Europe have done a massive work. I really want to congratulate them for having looked into how coordinate, how collaborate, and how to guide, give guidelines so that the best of the uh, pan-European approach to it could be uh, could be um, extracted. Yeah. You still see member states going on their own way, except you know you know there are always exceptions. But for the users, their preoccupation is what's going to happen to those data, yeah. even after they've been anonymized, and what's going to happen to those data after the crisis of the COVID has gone. I'm going, to cut, I'm, going to, I'm going to cut you out there because we're going to come to that part of the discussion is that in a second. Okay, okay, fine, fine. So uh, it was just an example, but yeah. what if the user understand that it's prominently for their health, um, right. health assistance? It's about transparency on the usage. Right. So I'd say half of people care only about privacy. The rest of the world, we don't know. But if the incentives are transparent, they're going to make a more informed decision and probably they're going to be more open to share. Okay, thank you. We will come back to COVID-19 uh, because there are questions coming up from the audience. Uh, bef I, before I take questions from the audience, uh, I did say at the outset, if anybody in the panel would like to react uh, from what they've heard from their fellow panelists, now is the opportunity. Anybody want to react to what they've heard from their colleagues on the panel? If not, we go straight to questions. Okay, okay, I'm going straight to questions. Uh, the, the panel can see the wording, by the way, on the right-hand side of their screen. Uh, so the first question is to you, Salah, uh, from a gentleman called Alexander Alvaro, who owner of a company called CCS. I'm not quite sure what that means, sir, or what it does. Uh, the question is to you, Salah, as follows. Can the GDPR, with regards to AI, artificial intelligence, be considered a competitive disadvantage compared to China and the United States? Salah. Uh what we think is that the uh, that uh, it raised what I talked about the innovation, so that the high levels of the uh, high levels of the data protection and the innovation, including the AI development, they can go hand and hand. So we haven't seen the evidence that the GDPR is that type of obstacle of the of the sharing the data that is needed for the AI. Uh, that would uh, that would hamper. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, often famously said that the EU has the values, while the others, US has the technology, China has the data. So, but what we think that what we have shown, what I, uh, with the GDPR, that it can be a standard setting value. So, what we are working also that the what the AI should be human centric, respecting the fundamental rights uh, too. And that way, these two uh, can go together. The GDPR was created to be technologically neutral, so that it is, it can be applied, it can be uh, uh, interpreted, and the solutions can be then found by developing new technologies that they are from the outset uh, uh, data protection uh, uh, compliant. So uh, what we uh, we don't uh, we don't see that uh, the it's the GDPR that would be in any way uh, hampering the development of the European AI. And the AI does not always uh, require personal data, but even when it requires, still then the fundamental rights would need to be respected. And we are just to remind that the regulation uh, uh, allows there are ways to allow the further processing of the personal data, and that we can when we have uh, uh, methods like the pseudonymization that can be useful tools in this uh, in this context and that are recognized under the regulation. So uh, 
all in all, we see that these two developments go hand in hand. Thank you, Sarah. Well, one reason why I was so rude to Isa because of the next question, which is about COVID-19. Um, so question from a lady called Nathalie Lanere, director of CIPL. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows what CIPL is, even though I don't. Uh, addressed to the entire panel. How do you reconcile the GDPR requirements and the increasing need to share data among public and private actors as evidenced by the COVID-19 crisis? It's, we can also broaden the question out, it seems to me, because I, again, from my perspective, see an awful lot of attention is focused on the, the private sector and, and its uh, compliance with GDPR. And we tend to occasionally forget that it also applies equally, as you will confirm, to the, the public sector and public authorities. So who'd like to maybe not tell this time first, but anybody else like to respond to this question from, from Natalie? The sharing of data between private and public actors. Okay, uh, Isa, go back, back to you, Isa. Okay, very quickly. I think, again, the question is about transparency. If the system is transparent and there is accountability and traceability means that no one can cheat the system, and, and it's human centric. As Sala said, we have a system that is human centric. And then we have the beauty of the technology that can automate things. But the technology can also trace and make very clear what the accountability metrics can be. If these things can spouse together, there would no be difficulties in finding the situations and the context for which users would consent for these public private partnerships. They yeah. consent if they are in control of when they want to change their mind. So unilaterally, the users should be given tools to activate deletion, for example, that they control, not someone else. They should be able to do it. And they should be able to decide the who's going to be shared by purpose, because GDPR defines scoping and purposes. It's something like a consumer choice. If consumers are reactive to choosing who they're going to be trusting enough to give a secondary usage right, that's fine because the technology can implement it, the parties benefit of it, but there's always an originating permission that comes from the users based on transparency. This is, I believe, really something very, very strong. We can make it a benchmark everywhere in the world. Okay, thank you. If nobody else wants to intervene, I'm going to go to the next question that they're coming in quite. Oh, sorry, Salo. Forgive me, Salo. Over to you. Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I would just, I, I just want to really uh, um, uh, reinforce and 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 uh, agree what Isabella just said about the trust. What what we think that in this health situation, it has been the uh, uh, really the discussion about the tracing apps has shown the really importance of the trust that people to have need to have that they would give voluntary uh, uh, their uh, data. So they are they are uh, thinking of these two health uh, privacy. Uh, and even in that situation, the trust uh, uh, trust aspect is very important. And the COVID situation has also shown the importance that we have this uh, uh, privacy by, by design, data processing by design, because now the tracing apps that have been then developed they have taken into account the privacy uh, uh, privacy aspects and the solutions, uh, at least what we have seen, seem to go to the direction where the privacy is respected. That was naturally then one of the main aspects of the Commission guidance that we were giving for the for the member states um, uh, in our when we recommend it. So just to say that we see that even in crisis situation, it's not so that the people are forgetting, uh, forgetting their uh, uh, privacy and rights. Actually, it sometimes reinforces that uh, feeling. Thank you. Uh, Andrea. I, I just wanted uh, to underline uh, that as a, as a board, we issued guidance uh, regarding um, the geolocation and tracing tools uh, already on, on the 21st of April. And uh, this week, uh, we adopted guidelines, uh, a statement regarding the interoperability uh, of these tracing tools. And I think it's quite important uh, to take into account that really, like uh, General Director and also Isabella said, it's important that the people trust and the trust of the people is uh, the most important to support these, uh, these apps, which are they were already developed and which are going to be developed because without the trust, the people uh, won't use them. 
and won't download them. And so these apps can't support uh, the, the health system. Because as you know, only doctors uh, and nurses and medi medicines are healing, but supporting uh, the crisis uh, are these techni technology tools. And I think if the people trust in what uh, is developed, it will be easier. And I think uh, what Isa said uh, at the beginning, uh, that privacy, that the, that the GDPR is a privacy engine. It has to be strong, transparent, and trusted environment. It has to be a strong, transparent, and trusted environment is one of the key issues. Because if you have this, the users uh, will use what you provide for them and to help them. Um, without, uh, the users won't use whatever you can do and whatever you can provide for them. So I think it's really important uh, to tell the people how these issues are working, how the technology is working, that you have maybe open source and you have a data protection impact assessment that is open and that shows uh, what these apps are doing. I think it's really important. Thanks. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, the next question uh, raises an issue that um, Isabella has already touched on from a lady called Elizabeth Sona or Sonas, who's a private citizen. The question is as follows. Once the pandemic passes, I am concerned with what will be done with any anon anonymized or de-identified data collected by technology companies and governments for the purpose of addressing the public health crisis. This is why I won't be downloading any tracing app. What can you say to EU citizens like me? Panel, over to you. Andrea again. Uh, thanks for passing the floor. Thanks for this really important question. In, our, in all our guidelines, uh, we addressed this and said that data, that these data has to be um, really not used anymore and they have to be deleted as, as soon as the crisis is over. Also, the Commission addressed this issue uh, in their in their papers. And in addition, um, when you as a government want to uh, give some aspects of, uh, of the GDPR a different spin, uh, according to Article 23 GDPR, uh, the board is just developing um, <coughs> guidelines what you have to do uh, that this is legal and uh, covered by the GDPR. And it always uh, includes an end date you always have to have a sunset clause. Uh, so, and if uh, these laws have sunset clauses, these data have to be deleted. Thanks. Thank you for the uh, important clarification, Andrea. If nobody else wants to come in, I'm going to move to the next question, which is addressed to Barbara. And from Helena Aguia, with a lawyer in individual practice. So Barbara, the question to you is, do you think that to be compliant to the GDPR, is a competitive advantage rather than a burden to your company. What are your views on what should be changed in order to let the data flows cross borders be guaranteed in order to optimize the business and guarantee the data protection? Sure, um, in terms of being compliant to the GDPR, having, having our customers trust in us in terms of how we process their data is absolutely a necessity in order to have them um, put human resources, financial data into the service. So I believe it's it's necessary and it, it would be an advantage to be able to demonstrate how, how we process their data. Um, I think that goes back to the very first question too, in terms of machine learning and AI to a certain extent. Um, I We believe that those um, go hand in hand, that there isn't a conflict in terms of GDPR and machine learning, um, in terms of being able to innovate but a lot of the discussion today around new technologies and new uses of data often focuses on the misuse of data um, as opposed to how you can actually process data, um, including in machine learning and unlock innovation in a way where it's built upon a privacy program that complies with GDPR. And so having set out privacy principles, Workday came out with three privacy principles that we commit to our for all of our customers um, that go hand in hand with GDPR, where we commit to putting privacy first, to innovating responsibly, to safeguarding fairness and trust, I believe can give our customers um, 
and potential customers uh, faith that we have a program and that we're um, that will protect their data, value their privacy, and that can help enable their compliance with GDPR. Um, so it's absolutely a, a necessity and um, an advantage, I believe, to be able to demonstrate that compliance. But in terms of looking at the cross-border data transfer mechanisms, um, one of the things that I think would really be helpful in terms of looking at how to make them easier to continue to transfer data, and especially in a cloud B2B environment, would be to clarifying some of the language in the existing standard contractual clauses. Um, there's still language that can suggest that you may need to get consent from every customer um, in terms of the ability to use subprocessors. And uh, I don't believe that's consistent necessarily with GDPR or with some of the Article 29 Working Party guidance where you can have, you know, um, general consent from, from the data controller, from our customers to use subprocessors as long as you're able to provide notice of new subprocessors, provide rights to object. Um, and so having that update in the cross-border data transfer mechanisms and the SECs in particular, I believe would really um, take away a lot of the discussion on how, how you're able to use third-party technologies, um, which is critical for a cloud provider and, and make those conversations easier and make the, the business flow easier. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. I can't believe we've been on for over an hour. We haven't mentioned e-privacy and e-evidence, and that's about to be addressed right now in the shape of the following question from Ian Macian from DigiPrivate. The question for you, Stella, and for you, Andrea. What is the status on e-privacy and the e-privacy and the e-evidence files? And how do you think the GDPR will interact with these two files? Sala. Uh for the so the e privacy uh, privacy uh, uh, that's uh, next specialis then for the GDPR on this its own area on specifically telecommunication uh, that has been based on the directive where the Commission then proposed to uh, kind of modernize and make it as a regulation. Uh, this regulation is still under negotiations with the Council and. Um, and then uh, uh, further for the parliament. So it is the uh, EU legislators are uh, working with it. Uh, I understand that the, now the incoming uh, German council presidency uh, has announced that they really aim to advance with the file that's in the e-privacy. Uh, we have we have continued all the legislative files also during the confinement time, but one has to say that there the negotiations have been, it, it stayed all uh, very often in very technical level because the negotiations were were um, uh, the, the, some of them were uh, still uh, having as an obstacle or having not uh, physical meetings that helps in the negotiations but uh, the work continues uh, same then for the e evidence file uh, it's in the negotiation and there uh, the progress and uh, is needed then rather from the side of the European Parliament. So we are waiting for the European uh, Parliament position. Uh, Parliament is also working on it uh, and uh, we hope that then in the second half of the year uh, uh, it would go it would go further uh, further there. And uh, uh, if, if, if I may uh, there, these were two pieces of legislation that has the link. So what, what we aim from the point of view of the GDPR is naturally the coherence. So the commission point is to work that the, uh, all, the, all the rules are coherent uh, to each other. So bringing the same principles. Because I wanted to mention then one more piece of legislation. We talked about this kind of the uh, using the data in transactions, uh, what you asked about the, for the consumers. So that has been also taken out, uh, into account in our, in our uh, consumer protection legislation. Uh, in the uh, uh, digital contents uh, uh, directive for the consumer uh, protection that was adopted last year, which is now in the implementation. So that brings, for example, the, the consumer uh, rights uh, for remedies also in the cases where the transaction was uh, was made uh, with data so we have so we have some legislation we have been able to to adopt so gdpr then was the consumer uh, contest directive for example and now we are still then working for the e privacy we are working with the e payment so uh, certainly uh, that's in the challenge but that's where we try to that that all this uh, all this uh, the framework of the our key would be consistent to each other 
Okay. Before I pass over to you, Andrea, there's a kind of follow-up question uh, sent in independently. I don't think people from the audience will confer. Um, from a gentleman called uh, Jürgen Bench uh, Asala, who's Director of Pub Policy and Public Affairs at the Interactive Software Federation of Europe. He's a bit more direct than the previous questioner. Um, the proposal for an e-privacy regulation risks undermining the GDPR. I'm sure you've heard that argument before, Salah. Uh, there are a lot of overlapping inconsistencies and a lack of alignment, in particular on the legal basis for the processing. Hasn't the Commission a role to play to reconsider this proposal and develop a more coherent text? You used the word coherence yourself just now, so how would you respond to Jürgen? Uh, so that's what we have uh, what we have aimed indeed is for the consistency so with our uh, uh, it is a proposal on the table it's now the co-legislators uh, co-legislators uh, uh, side so uh, in that sense the commission is not now in the uh, in the, in that role to reconsider our our views uh, on, on the matter but we are we are naturally strongly supporting uh, the co-legislators in the negotiations of, of trying to bring uh, the uh, clarity also it is true that it is not always uh, uh, easy uh, because these are very detailed regulations, each of them, and the, when the EU negotiations go or go on, uh, there come it's different people who negotiate the things. They bring different aspects, so that's also then one of the ro role of the Commission to bring this kind of the historical uh, uh, con consistency. So, and these are specific rules. So, when you have somebody as a lex specialis, that means naturally that it might take into account some specific situation and bring an own solution. But in 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 a uh, big picture, it is for the consistency that we aim. Okay, uh, we're running out of time, so I'd ask invite Andrea to be as as brief as possible. And if you want to come in, Andrea. Uh, nothing to add because we are not the legislator; we are just a regulator. But if we are being informed, we uh, we always contribute. That's the first issue, and the second issue is we already uh, issued a statement uh, spring last year. Uh, that the uh, that the e-privacy shouldn't uh, mustn't undermine the standards of the GDPR. So that's as brief as that. Thanks. Okay, we're coming to the end of our session, but I'm going to squeeze in two more questions if I can. A gentleman called Leon Molenberg, senior policy advisor at e-commerce Europe. Thank you, panel, for your clear insights. How do you see the payment, quote unquote, with personal data? for the supply of digital content as introduced in Article 3 of Directive 2 2019 uh, slash 770, the supply of digital content. I'm sure you're all very familiar with that directive. So um, who would like to respond to that payment with personal data? Asala, yeah. back to well, you. I, I can be very brief on that because this was the one what I, I just mentioned that we right. do have these uh, uh, rules that uh, that uh, ensure the rights of the consumers also in uh, this kind of situation. So it is about the uh, using the data in the in the transactions. Okay. And when we negotiated that, uh, uh, we we try to be clear again that this is then uh, is done in a way that is compliant with the GDPR. Okay. I'm going to take this as the last question, um, and in fact, it's a second question from Alexander Alvaro, but uh, let's use it as a way maybe for the panel to give their kind of concluding remarks. So they either address the question head on or they just cheekily use the time I'm going to give them to, to give some final, some final comments. The question again from Alexander, uh, does any, do any of the speakers believe it was when drafting the GTPR a mistake? to make it technology neutral? For example, how does the quote unquote, the right to be forgotten fit blockchain, a technology especially designed not to forget? Let's go in reverse order. Isabella, do you have anything to say to that? Or do you want to say something else in your last intervention? Again, the tricky questions for the startup. OK, fine. I, <laughs> I can pick up on that. Um, so how would I respond to that? What I would say, so blockchain is a promising technology. Indeed, decentralized um, infrastructure. It's something that uh, we're all looking at with promising um, promising future, but it's not going to be the only one and it's not for tomorrow and uh, it's not a particularly um, uh, efficiency green technology neither. So I think that GDPR had a merit that was to set principles because it doesn't need to consider what is the technological solution to achieve it. Europe is technology neutral and we've been advocating that principle across all the 
flat platforms, all the infrastructure, whether these are for communication or for content distribution or for payment, it's not about technology, it's about rights. So I think that there's always a merit in saying that one technology is probably more mature than another to solve the issues, but it doesn't mean that one is going to be precluded. So the GDPR can be reviewed and the assessment, they are already ongoing and there will, there will be a probable um, interesting development in how the Commission is going to be creating the coherence between the GDPR and e-privacy, which is really fundamentally important for the business to do the business. But I wouldn't be that frightened about whether it's, you know, the terms have been used right or wrong. First comes the rights, then comes the framework, and then comes the technology. So I would say it's not a big issue. Okay. Uh, Barbara. I agree. Um, I think it's critical for it to be technology neutral in order to allow us to continue to innovate. Um, we're not going to know what type of technology may be in place by the time a regulation comes out, um, but it's important to look to the underlying principles. And then that is why the, the guidance I refer to is also so critical that as new technology comes out, um, you know, how, how you interpret, how you meet the right to be forgotten. Um, could be different based on technology like blockchain and where we look to assistance and guidance. Um, but I believe it's critical um, for the, any of the regulations in the GDPR to be technology neutral and to us look at it as a principle-based approach. Okay, thank you. Andrea? In general, there's nothing to add because I think uh, it was no mistake, uh, the technological neutrality. And um, we as board, as we were not existent and still now, are not negotiating uh, any regulations or um, even directives. But I think the, it's, a, it's very good and very important that the GDPR has this techno technology um, neutral approach because so it, the right can fit to any technological development. And I think it's really important to underline this. And as the other speakers already did, I think it's a very good issue that the GDPR is technologi technologically neutral. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. The final word to you, Sala. Thank you. And uh, it's it's uh, uh, difficult to add anything more as we, we seem to share opinion on that one. Yeah, uh, uh, it was the right choice to have it technology uh, neutral. And that's also from the perspective of the legislator. We need stability on these uh, issues. We need stability also for the uh, uh, for the these uh, businesses of developing new technologies. So that way the big principles uh, serve that purpose better than then uh, individual listing of the technologies. And Maybe to say that we see also here an example or that when we ask uh, a technology to be uh, uh, bring a privacy by design, this means that currently, for example, there are discussions to develop the blockchain so that the models are living up with the GDPR, for instance, so that the personal data is not the part which is stored in the blockchain. So if we have principles, right? And I, uh, this is indeed uh, maybe to finish that uh, we have the GDPR. Uh, it is. It brings the rights. Uh, it uh, rights to the citizen. It brings the opportunities. It brings the stability to the businesses. So I would say that in both sides, uh, uh, let's let's use these rights. Let's use these opportunities. Also now in the future years with our general data protection regulation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sal, and thank you to all of you. I think we have to stop now, partially because day has dawned in San Francisco behind Barbara. So that's one reason to, to move on. Um, uh, <laughs> before I hand over to Eileen, I just want to thank all of you on the panel. Um, at Forumio, we never take for granted that people are very busy and people making the time uh, is always, uh, we're always grateful that for that. And uh, so thank you indeed, all four of you. Uh, you clearly uh, had things to say which are really important for the audience. The audience responded by posing a whole uh, array of questions which you did a very good job, all of you, at, at, at addressing. So thank you very much for that. Um, now it's my, my very uh, pleasant duty to hand over to uh, Elin Chivo, Senior Policy Analyst at the Center for Data Innovation. And you remember the score you go to the have your say function, you'll see on the, in the sessions uh, part of the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, and if you want to take part and be seen on screen, you simply press on the button, share audio and video. Uh, thank you again. 
uh, my panelists uh, for being here and uh, thank you and see you soon. Over to you, Aline. Thank, thank you. you. Hello and uh, welcome everyone uh, to this session as part of Forum Europe's uh, event on GDPR two years on. My name is Elin Chivo and I'm Senior Policy Analyst for the Center for Data Innovation, which is a Brussels NTC based uh, think tank active in tech policy. I'll be your host for this quick 30 minute uh, have your say session, which I find is an innovative format and a great initiative of Forum Europe. This is really meant to, to be an informal and interactive moment. If you lose connection, you can follow us on YouTube. And if you'd like to tweet, uh, feel free to use the hashtag uh, GDPR two year on and Forum Europe's handle. And the recording will be available after the event as well. Um, so a few stakeholders have expressed their interest to take the floor for this session and to share their thoughts um, on the discussions that have taken place uh, in the previous panel, but also overall and share their views on, on you know, the, the, the EU's data protection rules implemented over two years ago now. Um, there there is space and time for Q and A's with, with you, with all participants joining. You are our audience, but you can uh, post your questions for our discussions in the chat, or you can ask to contribute directly. Um, so just let us know also by, by the chat if you'd like to take the floor at some point. Um, I know some of you did ask uh, very good questions in the previous session, uh, but now let's start uh, by hearing from our distinguished guests. Uh, I will invite uh, to this uh, session now uh, Ricardo Castanera, uh, who's Digital and Technology Councillor for Public Policy and Government in European Affairs. You're attaché at the permanent representation of Portugal to the EU. So the floor is yours. Welcome. Thanks to the Forum Europe uh, team for the invitation, this kind of invitation. Um, for sure, like you, uh, I've been, um, I've assisted to the, I've attended the, 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 the previous panel discussion, which was a very interesting one and uh, I would say quite impressive. Um, and I took some notes uh, and I, that's why I want to share right now with you or start is sharing some, some of the notes that I took. The first one is that it's quite interesting that uh, the discussion is around two years uh, of the GDPR, but then uh, they discussed a lot on e-privacy. It's quite interesting to see how one uh, issue is absolutely connected and linked to the other one. Uh, this is the proof of the um, interaction, but also of the overlap that still do exist between the two uh, uh, regulations, the two uh, legislative uh, frameworks. Um, that's why that's our task in the Council. It has been so difficult during the last three years to discuss uh, the privacy uh, file. Um, now you can understand um, how um, difficult it has been to set a, the right uh, balance uh, between the two uh, different uh, aspects that uh, if there is a common ground, there is some other aspects that are absolutely different between one and the other one. But it's true that uh, um, there's still a way to go uh, in order to improve uh, the e-privacy the e file. Um, as far as we know, the, Germans, uh, the German presidency uh, will try to get the general approach, uh, which means that probably the trilogues will start till the end of the year and the Portuguese president that will be the next one um, we'll, uh, we'll have the trilogues and conclude the file. This is something that it's uh, uh, still open, but uh, we are, I can tell you, already working on that kind of scenario. But it's, this is the first remark that I would like to share. It's GDPR, but e privacy it's always on the channel. The second remark is um, about uh, uh, the commission uh, started to put us all thinking about digital sovereignty, which is a very interesting concept. The question is how we can get that digital sovereignty and probably uh, setting standards, setting patterns like the GDPR uh, has been and still is on a global uh, dimension can be a way to get that kind of digital sovereignty. Digital sovereignty is not exactly uh, it does not mean exactly uh, protectionism, not at all, um, but it probably uh, means a way that the European uh, uh, legal and regulatory framework 
based on some kind of examples like the GDPR is, can enhance uh, uh, European economy and especially the European values um, when compared to, to the other regions of the world. This is something that uh, I would like also to, 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 to underline. The third is that, um, and it has been also mentioned during the previous panel, um, the tracing apps discussion. Uh, we've started to discuss them, to discuss in the council and, and especially the capitals, um, uh, the tracing apps uh, since last March. One very important detail is that the main uh, aspect uh, of the discussion was not privacy, neither data protection, was interoperability. It's very interesting that, of course, to get uh, the most effective um, uh, results uh, coming from the, 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 the tracing apps, it must be uh, trustable and people must trust on that. Of course, it must secure uh, the, 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 the protection of the personal data, uh, and also the privacy of the users. But it's quite interesting that where uh, we uh, uh, put more time and more energy to set uh, uh, the, the common ground was exactly interoperability. It's, it's quite interesting to see um, the, 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 I would say, the, this kind of uh, uh, um, approach. Another thing is, um, Eileen and, uh, and, and colleagues, <clears throat> Let's take a look just on the highlights of the GDPR, but there are also some lowlights. I think that the previous panel uh, was much more about the highlights, much more about the positive things, which are a lot of. I would say the most important one to me is that it has been the most globally celebrated piece of EU legislation in the recent past. It's absolutely, there is no doubt about that. And I think that we must be, I would say, uh, um, uh, it's very important for us as Europeans. Uh, and also that uh, GDPR has increased accountability um, and has resulted in greater awareness of data protection issues at all levels. This is something that it's very, very important too. Mm -hmm. Data protection suddenly became one of the most important aspects for citizens, for common citizens, and especially for, the one, for those that uh, uh, deal with digital uh, matters. But let me make or play a bit the the role of uh, uh, the representative of some uh, small companies uh, that uh, with whom I've been talking a lot during the last months, and then we're gonna see uh, some low lights. Uh, for example, uh, many uh, small and medium uh, companies um, they lack they they lack the personal and also the know why to meet the requirements. Even after two years, they still do have uh, uh, to face uh, these kind of challenges uh, regarding resources, human resources, um, and, and those techni technical uh, expertise. This is something that it's, it has been shared with us uh, several, several times. Uh, one other uh, challenge is, for example, that GDPR does not recognize or make the distinction um, uh, between corporate group, uh, corporate group companies. It means that um, according to GDPR, companies that belong to a corporate group are not treated as a single entity, but rather as an independent unit. And this is something that uh, causes a lot of trouble, especially for those that have uh, entities with relationship with third parties, with third countries. Um, in other way, GDPR does not distinguish between B2B and B2C. Uh, treats uh, uh, these all equally. And uh, as you can imagine, this demands a lot of bureaucratic effort, uh, especially uh, for the work between companies. This is something that uh, also should be, uh, for sure, it will be part of the review. Uh, and if it is not, it should be reviewed uh, and uh, uh, assessed afterwards. And uh, last but not uh, the least, I would say that uh, uh, probably the the EDPB, the data protection uh, national authorities, they should or they could uh, invest a bit more on uh, assistance tools and process templates uh, for the companies, um, for the citizens, um, to help them uh, in order to to I would say avoid misunderstandings and help them to deal with uh, with uh, the implementation 
of the GDPR. Um, this is very the, the very last uh, uh, comment or remark. It's true, it has been mentioned in the previous panel, not in the way that I will put it, but it's true that is still a distinction between the way that private sector implemented the GDPR and public sector. It's true that there is a long way to go on public sector. It's true that Govs must invest much more in, uh, in, 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 in its own entities uh, in order to develop the, 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 the legal grounds and the principles that the GDPR um, has on it. To start, I would like to share those remarks. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for bringing all these points. So yeah, this, this hot potato that is uh, e-privacy being still in everyone's minds. And you seem to agree with uh, what Salah Sastamoyan said um, in the previous panel, the Deputy Director of DigiJust, uh, who mentioned the GDPR uh, you know, has what it takes to drive innovation and that uh, the EU can, can act as a standard setting more generally for the digital or in the digital economy. And, and, and you've mentioned some of the lessons learned from COVID and that interoperability issue being front and center. That was very interesting. And also, uh, thanks for bringing in some of these elements for improvement of the GDPR, uh, especially regarding uh, guidance and resources to comply. Um, of course, I'd like to hear uh, you more on perhaps the, the EU presidency's um, uh, priorities uh, as, as Portugal will, will take over in January, but perhaps we'll have time to, to get back to that later. In the meantime, um, it's a pleasure to introduce you to uh, Estelle Massé, who's Senior Data Analyst at Access Now, which is a um, global nonprofit that defends and extends the digital rights of people around the world. So the, the floor is, is yours, Estelle. What would you like to, to share today, taking stock of the, the GDPR two years on? Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation to provide some comments after um, the great discussion that happened. Um, two years after the implementation of the, the GDPR, I think as NGOs we find ourselves in, a, in an interesting um, situation where we want to pay tribute to the work that has been done by the European Union, not just the European Commission, since the regulation has been adopted by all institutions but also um, raise the alarm on some of the issue with the implementation. Um, first on the paying tribute part, um, part of things, um, the um, European Union has done the right thing by modernizing its data protection framework because obviously the 95 directives was a pre-internet era legislation that really needed to be upgraded. And it has brought up a lot of um, clarity on how users rights needed to be applied in this context. It was right as well to be technologically neutral. There was discussion on that on the panel lately. Um, and it's quite interesting to see how there is a lot of chatter in the EU bubble on whether or not the lawmakers mark, uh, missed the mark by not discussing AI in that time or not discussing blockchain. But if you do a search in the GDPR for the word like clouds or so, um, search engine or social media, you will also get a result of zero. None of those technology are mentioned because it's actually the design. No technology is specifically mentioned because it's a general data protection regulation. It's a baseline rules that apply each time you use and process data, both to protect citizens, but also the second part on the title of the law that people tend to forget. It's also enabling the free movement of data and has a whole chapter on how to do that. So. Um, the whole exercise of having the legislation was very difficult because you had to please the citizen and protect their fundamental right, but you also had to ensure that uh, companies were able to operate and have clear rules around it. Um, being the European Union and having at the time 28 countries, that does mean that there had been some flexibilities there that from a user perspective are not always the best for us to, um, to navigate in order to ensure that the same rights is applied everywhere, but all in all, we do think that the GDPR does improve the situation for user, and this has been demonstrated by the great number of people that have used the rights that are available to them and the number of complaints that were received. Um, now, obviously, two years on, we were expecting more on the enforcement side. We've done our part in trying to raise awareness on those rights and trying to bring the data protection discourse um, in, into, into the public. Um, but obviously we would have wanted to see more 
um, more actions on the data protection authority sides. And we know that a lot of these actions has been difficulted by the fact that a lot of them don't have enough resources at the moment. And this is one of our main calls for now. If we have spent seven years modernizing a data protection law, we need to put the resources, financial, technical, and staff, in order to make sure that it's delivered. We cannot continue to say that it's one of the best law that the EU has adopted, that have it mentioned by many CEOs around the world, but not having the concrete actions in place to make sure that people are complying with it and make sure that rights are being enforced. So we have a message to the member states and to the European Commission as well, which is to fund the DPAs to ensure their independence and for in order for them to be able to act and not just to put fines, but there is a lot of other avenues that exist under the GDPR to actively protect our rights. You know, you can ask for data to be deleted it's been, if it's been obtained unlawfully. You can ask for transfer to be suspended if it's uh, also not happening lawfully. So, you know, fine is only one of the many enforcement uh, resources that authority have, but it's really the steps that we're waiting for, for the GDPR to truly become a reality because even years on, we're already talking about the impact it may have on others' laws, but the actual impact of the GDPR itself is still uh, need to be felt from um, from a user perspective. So the our main message with GDPR is here, but it's not still fully living to the expectation that we want it to. Mm. Um, but it doesn't mean that it needs to be changed. The letter of the law is correct. It just needs to be applied and it's where we want the resource to be put. Um, if we talk about other technologies that are being discussed and other discussion happening in Brussels, um, we don't think that the GPR needs to be changed in order to add words AI or comply with it. You know, when we talk about AI, a lot of time we talk about automated services and they are discussed under the GDPR and there are specific rights for that. There may be um, some further discussion that needs to happen on what happens if my data is used to make decisions about other people, you know. There was comment on the previous panel, which was interesting of like, what if as a person, I don't really mind about sharing my data, which in a connected world, it's much more complicated than that because your data might impact what, what happened to someone else. So it's not just your choice and it's also linked to a fundamental right. So it's not about something you can just give up and we'll see happen what uh, we'll see later what happens. So there might be additional protection that needs to be considered, like in the case of e privacy for the communication part, but in the case of AI as well, to ensure that the technology does not create uh, further risk for people. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there to continue uh, the discussions, but um, I think you've got that the main message we had from our side is that um, we have the GDPR on paper, now we want to have it in practice. You mentioned the GDPR is built to be flexible for, for various technologies and does need to be updated for AI. Um, uh, in your view, and users have been empowered by the GDPR, and you you raise the need to to get more resources on the deck now to ensure uh, enforcement of rights is effective and, and implementation uh, issues are dealt with. Uh, now, with apologies for this slight delay caused uh, by myself, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the next uh, discussant, who's uh, Aurelia Schwander. Uh, you are the Data Protection Officer of Luxembourg's Ministry of Health. Uh, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you for the invitation and I think I will uh, directly jump on what Ricardo says about digital sovereignty. Uh, I will also pick up the trust from the previous uh, discussion and I would like to discuss as well about uh, health uh, data space in my, uh, in my situation because uh, I think with the crisis uh, We've all realized that uh, personal data exchange, personal data processing, it was really needed. And uh, as such, it's not a bad thing. It's something that we need to, to realize. We need personal data. And uh, we need personal data to foster innovation, to provide uh, quality healthcare services to the citizen. Uh, and for me, GDPR, as it has been said, it's not something preventing from this. On the contrary, the GDPR will be an enabler to exchange data and to frame this exchange. And this is super important to understand. Uh, so we need data. Sometimes we need to exchange the data. Uh, and uh, we need to create trust for this. Because, of course, people that are subject, they need to trust us. Uh, when processing the data. And GDPR for me is giving us the tool to create this trust. 
to have this commitment from data subject to say, okay, I understand why authorities are processing the data and why it's important and that I need to be confident in the way it will be used because we will have transparency and this is a core principle of data protection. So we will explain what we are doing with the data. We will have also security. So for example, pseudonymization and all this will be even more important in the case of further uh, secondary use for public interest, but also for scientific research because people do need to understand that uh, we need to treat the patient, we need to maybe sometimes process the data for public interest in the matter of health, and also we need data for research because otherwise we will never be able to, like for example, uh, find new medicine, and it's really, part, it's really relevant for the crisis. We need to do this to be able, for example, to find a vaccine or a medicine uh, and at the same time, we'll ensure protection of personal data. Um, and all this, GDPR is giving us the tool to achieve this safe, I would say, use of personal data for secondary purpose. Um, and also, uh, will give us even more, because for me, GDPR is not a revolution, as sometimes data protection authorities are saying, it's an evolution, but what is very, I would say, a highlight with the GDPR is really the cooperation with the data protection authorities, with the fact that no, it's clear what are their role, what they can do, how they can enforce. And uh, this is for me the last safeguards that uh, GDPR is providing us. So really important, processing data, it's not a bad thing. It's something that GDPR will enable, not prevent, and it will be done uh, in a safe uh, framework, I would say. Thank you, Aurelia. Uh, may I actually uh, ask you um, a question that was raised by one of our participants in the chat, because I think you'd probably be able to, to address this. Uh, so um, it's from Octavian Popescu, uh, who is asking, from a legal GDPR perspective, can you comment on the ownership status of data collected, especially online, in other words, is the GDPR defining who owns the data collected, uh, assuming that ownership is a relation uh, that is legally clarified? This is possibly indeed a key issue for the Im implementation of the GDPR. Do you have any thoughts on this comment question? Uh, it will be my personal opinion because, uh, you know, as a public administration, we are not really speaking about data ownership. And uh, personally, I'm not really comfortable with this uh, notion because it, it means that you will consider personal data as a good. And uh, for me, it's not really this, data protection and personal data. It's about using the data for purpose according to legal obligation, legal requirements. So I would say rather no, but uh, maybe the other participants have a, they have a thought on this as well um, maybe if someone does please let me know and then i'll move to uh, another discussion are you boyana you would have an, uh, an answer to yes. this so maybe i can introduce you can you go ahead with your uh, statement and, and follow up uh, addressing that question so boyana bellamy you are president of the center for information uh, policy leadership which is a global privacy and security think tank uh, based in dc london and brussels welcome um, let me make some general comments about GDPR that uh, we at SIPL have put forward in the response to uh, the, the consultation and the two-year um, sort of review period. And we have make quite a lot of points there, many of them positive, many of them um, uh, benefits of GDPR that we have seen with the organizations we work and in the marketplace, but some, of course, unfulfilled promises and still uh, uh, challenges. So. Um, um, let me focus on, on sort of unfulfilled promises just because of, of the time. First of all, um, uh, accountability is one of the pillars of GDPR and it is the pillars of this modern digital economy, yet we haven't really seen accountability being picked up by regulators and by all organizations uh, that have to comply with GDPR. And as you know, we at CIPL have been 
pushing accountability and the need for uh, comprehensive privacy programs as a baseline. Um, uh, but but apart from some of the really top organizations, we haven't seen the pickup of accountability more across the marketplace. And I think regulators are all slightly to blame because they haven't been promoting and encouraging accountability as a principle. And so really GDPR has got all the tool toolkits and toolbox that we need. It has got the foundation stones. It, it provides for accountability. It provides for uh, binding corporate rules, for example. It provides for certifications, but like there are no joining points between them. And if you talk to some of the most enlightened and best in class organizations who are implementing GDPR, PR, you can see that existence of a privacy program is probably what enables them to have a binding corporate rules and then that program could be also certified or certifiable and so that's the link that we need to make right and I, can, I haven't kind of seen that yet um, and I think accountability is incredibly important because it is really what drives organizations to do their best it's not just about legal compliance and avoiding that four percent two percent fine it's about actually um, um, and Aurelia, I'm with you there, leveraging your data, being able to use information in a responsible way. And in this world of post-COVID and in the world of data sharing and European data strategy, Ricardo, you talked about that as well in the previous panel, it's incredibly important that we uh, push accountability as an enabler of, the, of wider data strategy as well. So, um, you know, that's to me one thing of, the, of GDPR that I'm not seeing very many people speak about, even though, as I say, I work with lots of organizations that are implementing these very comprehensive uh, and systematic privacy programs uh, that are based on accountability. And in fact, uh, I have to put a gap plug here. We have just published um, a report on uh, how 17 organizations, including two SMEs and one university, implement uh, global privacy uh, or privacy program through accountability, through concrete case studies and examples. And I hope this will inspire others to do this because I think GDPR enables this. And of course, this would help DPAs. So we all talk about the lack of resources of DPAs and DPAs being swamped by complaints, uh, swamped by breach notifications, not being able to discharge their function. You know, more resources is not going to do it. What is going to do it is actually smarter DPAs who are more targeted, more risk-based in their own work, uh, more strategic, and in fact, I encouraging accountability, right? Because the more accountable your organizations you have, you're encouraging race to the top. So everybody gets gets better because everybody wants to be a trusted partner in this digital ecosystem. And that's why we want regulators to promote, encourage and incentivize accountable behaviors as well. And that could be also in mitigation and enforcement as well. If you are a accountable organization, but you have a breach and you're still able to demonstrate that you've done everything right, that should be taken into account. So this for me is really important. And again, to mention in this post-COVID world, uh, is the only way to enable this wider use and collection of data that enables trust and is done in a responsible way as well. Um, so that's my first point. The second point is kind of what I call um, some um, tweaks in GDPR interpretation. Again, nothing wrong with the principles themselves, but it's the interpretation sometimes that really worries me. And this is not just on the part of DPAs, it's also on the part of experts, lawyers out there, uh, people who are, you know, de delivering certifications and, and consultancies. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we, we in Europe truly interpret these rules uh, in, a, in a harmonized way as well, right? Um, and I'm kind of not seeing that yet. Um, so some examples also of, of where we need that more progressive uh, interpretation is around legal basis for processing. Consent is not the legal base in GDPR, yet everybody keeps quoting that and everybody keeps talking about that uh, beyond Europe as well. Well, that's not what GDPR does, says. It is one of many bases. And in fact, consent is a mistaken legal base because uh, often, right, because individuals are really not able to consent properly and they are fatigued from consenting. And in fact, in many cases, consent doesn't really apply. So we need to be comfortable to use other legal bases 
such as legitimate interest, such as contractual necessity, such as vital interest, public interest, particularly in the COVID world, right? We, we are seeing more need to use these legal bases as well. Uh, the second point around tweaking is, um, 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 and you mentioned Aurelia, this scientific research research exemption again, you know, what does this really mean? And, and you know, how do we enable uh, responsible data analytics uh, and use of data for wider research purposes uh, by private and public sector as well in an accountable way. I think that's also really uh, up there for grabs and we need to kind of talk more about that as well. The third um, uh, tweak in interpretation is around uh, anonymous, pseudonymous data. Again, I get very worried when I see Dutch Data Protection Authority uh, saying there's no such thing as anonymous data, therefore we can't share aggregate data. Well, you know, uh, if there is no anonymous data, well, then uh, then everything is personal data. And how are we going to comply with this law? So we, we can't have these sort of broad statements. We really need to enable responsible use of anonymous data through safeguards, best risk mitigations, best technology, and kind of contractual safeguards as well, which give us comfort that we are addressing the risk of, of de-identification as well. And linked with that is the risk-based approach of GDPR as well. Again, a great tool. And I'm very proud that we have risk-based approach of G in GDPR, which means that companies and public sector bodies should be concentrating and focusing on where there is the highest risks to individuals, right? Uh, and then, of course, doing privacy impact assessments and calibrating privacy program and accountability based on risk. And we would like regulators to behave in that way as well. Now, again, I'm not seeing much of that. It is not a horizontal law. It really does apply differently based on risk. And I would like more discussion of what are those risks and harms that we see in the marketplace and more consensus between organizations and regulators on what constitutes risk and harm. I think now we have got some um, uh, um, some good precedents already. I have seen organizations who are building risk assessments that include wider human rights impact and wider societal impact as well. But we need consensus because otherwise, what one organization thinks or one DPA thinks may not be what everybody else thinks. And again, in, in, in the context of COVID, right, where you have to balance the use of data and then risks to individuals and then other rights, you really realize how important it is to actually utilize some of these GDPR tools and concepts. So as I say, lots of great concepts, but I, I have we have to see better application of these concepts. I'm not going to talk about consistency and um, DPAs working um, more uh, um, uh, efficiently together. I think there's been a huge progress, but I want to say something in um, slightly in defense of DPAs. It's not easy, right? They are applying the law, which really has given them a very difficult task, a very complex a uh, burdensome one-stop shop procedure. It wasn't meant to be like that, but it ended to be like that. So if there is any need to tweak bits and bobs from the commission or in the way the GDPR works, I think that is the place where we could actually do some, some, some um, cosmetic changes that actually would make the, the role of DPAs better and easier and would enable that more uh, cooperative and consistent approach and really truly one-stop shop. At the moment, it is far too complicated. And again, the promise isn't quite there and DPAs are doing best they can with a very difficult task. Final point um, is looking forward. Um, and you, some of you have talked about this already. How do we make sure that GDPR sits very well together with the rest of European strategy, either on e-privacy, uh, on AI, on data. Um, I think this is really very important. Um, um, uh, we are doing a project on accountable AI and, and sort of working and feeding to the Commission's work on, on, on the AI white paper. And I get a bit scared when I see uh, so many requirements in potential AI regulation, which in fact are addressed by GDPR. So we really can't have two laws uh, dealing with the same thing because GDPR addresses use of data for AI, right? It does. It has got principle-based approach from fairness to transparency to uh, automated decision-making to security. It is all there and we are seeing companies do the accountable practices around AI. So we need to build on that more. And the same uh, is of course on data strategy, right? If we really want European data space 
and data to flow freely and European companies to build their capabilities around data use and data sharing. Well, we have to enable data sharing. We cannot uh, be um, uh, sort of saying all the time, GDPR doesn't allow this. GDPR asks for consent. And I'm hearing a lot of that in the marketplace. It's wrong. And we really have to fight against that. GDPR enables sharing of data if it is done appropriately appropriately and responsibly and with accountability. So we need to really fit. It's like Lego, Lego, um, uh, uh, um, uh, Legoland, right? Where you have to fit all these pieces that work together. Um, and of course, we also have to uh, think about some innovative ways in which we will not only uh, work with all these different laws, but the regulators should behave as well in the same way. So I'm really encouraged to see uh, regulators such as the UK Information Commissioner. I know UK is leaving uh, EU or has left or Norway, which is um, kind of EEA, but OK, uh, using regulatory sandbox uh, in privacy, in data protection, to enable these new innovative uses of data, but in a way which provides for feedback, reiterative compliance, and sort of safe space with the regulatory input so that we can actually achieve something better. And so I would like to see regulatory sandbox picked up uh, by all the other data protection authorities and also um, in the context of AI regulation and data strategy as well, because I think that really is something that we in Europe do need. And again, it has started with data protection, like so many different things, and can be exported in um, sort of other areas of EU law. So maybe I'll stop there and I'm happy to... Uh, oh, yes, sorry. May I give a point about data ownership? Um, because sure. I am... Briefly, you, just a very minutes left. So. I absolutely, I, I, I think this is not the way to look at uh, data. Um, uh, data protection, data privacy is a human right. It's not a, a matter of who owns data. In fact, uh, in this world where data should be shared, again, COVID has showed us, you know, my, my health data may be incredibly important for somebody else's also life. So we need to enable sharing and use of data without any um, look at data ownership. Uh, 20 years ago, I actually did a did my master thesis in the European University Institute on data protection. And this was a theory that was very popular many years ago, that data protection is a property right. Well, it is not. There is no ownership in data. So I hope we stop talking about that and on to something more progressive. So thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. And thanks for your comprehensive overview. So you mentioned accountability and responsible use and uh, the need for smarter DPAs, uh, which would be more risk-based and strategic, acting as trusted partners. And you mentioned there's room for tweaking, let's say, the GDPR and accommodate for needed flexibility. Uh, and also you raised, and thank you very much for that, the, the need to avoid an overlap between existing requirements of the GDPR and potential new ones, uh, which an AI framework would, would bring in. So thanks, uh, thank, thank you all for all your comments. Uh, there is one question that was raised from, from our audience and I wanna make sure that you know, they get a little bit of, of, of time through me. Uh, so one question that was asked by Natasha White is uh, in the bigger picture, how will GDPR affect uh, health data and its use uh, when it comes to the AI white paper we mentioned, and, and, and Boyana, you mentioned the EU data strategy, um, more specifically in terms of the empowerment of people, so patients to control what happens with their health data and yet uh, ensuring that the collection of data for AI systems can place Europe in a strong competitive uh, global position. Uh, who would like to um, address this, um, this question or this, this comment from the participants? No? All right. I think it basically refers to uh, how the GP, whether the GDPR, the GDPR is enough to uh, empower people and make sure they get to control their data when it comes to the uh, health data, which is quite sensitive. Um, I wanted to just do, oh, sorry, yes. I'm, I'm happy. I don't want to talk. I don't want to allow, I don't know, Ricardo is maybe saying something, but I think GDPR does ena enable individuals to control their data. And I think this is this uh, other side of the coin to the consent, which I don't think we should be focusing on. Um, transparency, hugely important, right? Putting onus on companies to be accountable and protect my data, hugely important. All the rights that GDPR provides uh, from access to correction, objection, deletion, uh, are, are hugely important. I 
I think that is enough to enable um, us to actually control data. And of course, then if, if things go wrong, we have redress. So I, I think GDPR allows um, uh, proper use of health data, but we need to forget this reticence risk. Uh, this is what I've been talking about. I'm seeing a lot in the marketplace reticence risk. People are worried to share data because they think they're going to be violating GDPR, right? And there is this big 4%, 2% uh, stick to hit them. And that's not the way to think about, right? So, so we need to encourage responsible sharing of data and scientific research, anonymous data, and some of these legal bases I talked about would also help enable that. All right. Thank you so much. Um, unless anyone has a brief reaction, I'm going to close the session. No? All right. Well, then. Uh, thank you very much to to all of you, uh, the, the the five of you for for joining today, the four of you, sorry, uh, and for uh, all the the participants' uh, contributions and for joining. A big thank you to to Forum Europe for organizing the the event today. I will now let you join a virtual networking reception, which is available uh, until at least 4:30. Uh, and uh, yet again, something innovative, which is an opportunity for you to visit Forum Europe's virtual uh, networking lounge, uh, browse uh, through the uh, virtual uh, exhibition area. So it's an opportunity as well to join discussions and partners and, and sponsors private uh, networking rooms. So I let you discover all of that. Again, thank you so much for joining and thank you, uh, thank you. to the four of you for, for your contributions. And I wish you all a great rest of the day and see you very soon. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Goodbye. Thanks. <laughs>